thank you so much for inviting me to this, to moderate this session. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, you gave me an introduction, so everybody knows who I am. But I would like to introduce Tommy. Uh, Tommy has been touring as a bass and cello player globally in a wide range of genres for over 20 plus years but has in recent years focused on his work as composer for own ensembles, commissioned works for various crossover ensembles, orchestras, and soloists. As an educator, Tommy is titled Associate Professor at the National Academy of Music in Esbjerg, Denmark, where he's primarily working in the field of improvisation and composition. He has, over the recent five years, made multiple artistic research projects, including pedagogical research projects. The project we will discuss today, as we have seen, comprises two main phases, namely a composition process, where Tommy, on the basis of the collected material and a further analysis thereof, composes a genre-neutral work into an ensemble consisting of the 12 intertwined musicians and a concert part, where the ensemble meets, rehearses, and performs the work. And that is how I understand it going to happen soon, the second phase. Welcome, Tommy. I give the word to you now. Thank you for coming here, anyway, <laughs> to moderate this session. And thanks, for Christopher, for inviting me to do this at this symposium. I would like to start to invite also Ida <laughs> Bak Jensen, who sits here. Thank you. Who has uh, uh, been doing this um, documentary-ish movie we just saw. Um, and we had a very close cooperation about this movie. I started to make these uh, conversations and film them myself and thought that I could do that myself, which is, was absolutely stupid, of course. So I had to stop after doing all this material and invite, trying to find out who should I work with. I felt very lonely suddenly <laughs> in this project after all this information from all these um, beautiful musicians I had talked to. Yeah. So we will come back and talk about um, things about the, um, the movie in a short while. Yeah. Um, so I will try to um, uh, explain how and why I think this, this um, subject is so important to me. First of all, it's about my own life as a touring musician and a composer. So by just doing that, <clears throat> I felt an urge to remove myself a little bit out from how I feel and what I think and see what other people think. That's the first move. Um, and by trying to find out who I should meet, uh, I wanted to meet people, more or less, who also had a very highly professional level uh, as a musician and also some of them composers. Not of all of these musicians are composers. Some of them see themselves as uh, very deeply improvising in their life and in their profession, and some of them, they don't want to talk about improvisation and they don't want to improvise, as long as we talk about it. But if they play, they will improvise, if I'm in the neighborhood anyway, without maybe knowing they are improvising, or we can see it in different ways. But anyway, uh, it's not occasionally why it's these people who is invited to be part of the project. And, and luckily, uh, all of them said, yes, I would like to meet you, that would be nice. And some of them I have also been, uh, worked with a lot as a musician but maybe not as a composer. So we have met in many different kinds of environments all over the globe, in fact, in many, many different cultures. So it's not about, uh, it's fun to go to another culture and see, oh, it's so nice here, it's different here. That's not, this project is not about that. It's about very, and I was very shortly um, touchdowns on these different places uh, where we had these conversations also. It was not like I was there for a week, I was there maybe for 24 hours or 48 hours. Just to feel the same drive as, as uh, recent years where I'm traveling. Okay. So, I was very curious to try to find out 
through these conversations. Uh, if, if this microphone it's not really working all the time, but Just right now it's working. Okay. Um, I wanted to see if, uh, if we could talk, uh, I hoped for, we could talk about some cross-cultural competence and also how strong that is and also inside of a profession and just as a human being in your own environment. Also the complexities as individuals as we are, uh, what kind of competences we have socially and also what kind of decisions we make when we are alone and when we are together. So by doing these conversations, I tried not to ask any questions to see if it was a possibility to have a, how to say, a neutral starting point so we didn't try to uh, answer and define answers and everything. It was very problematic <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, I failed completely on some of the interviews. But some of the interviews went really well. And that was my problem, that was my disturbance. In fact, nobody of them had that disturbance because I was the invitation guy, so to speak. Um, but how come they failed, some of them? Uh, how come they failed? Yeah. yeah, they failed. I mean, you have seen, uh, Ida has also seen... Uh, the, I've seen all the material. Yeah. <laughs> it's around 14 hours of video down to 28, 28 minutes. So... Uh, you can also say that, no, for me it feels like it, it, it failed because some of the conversations was not fluently mm. so interesting, maybe, not for me or for them, or why should we talk about this? Yeah. Is this really necessary? We're already doing it, Yeah. right? We're already playing, we're already composing, we are meeting, we are traveling. Why should we use time to talk about that? Yeah. So, but using the phenomenological approach anyway, not to be too uh, let's see, strict on that, I really try to do that. And I try to use listening and wondering and uh, to be aware as the primary focus in the, in the conversations. Uh, using not really time frame, have an open possible uh, session uh, and see if we can achieve any kind of an interest in our conversation which was truly interesting. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, by doing this, I tried to use it as a metaphor for myself and with Ida, yeah. uh, with doing the movie and see if we also could talk about yeah. uh, the, the information, which we did, and it was, it was maybe you can tell me, or tell, maybe you can uh, tell a little bit about how we did that, because that was interesting. When I presented this material for you, how it all began when I got into the process. Yeah. Yeah, so I got this uh, huge material of footage, like 14 hours, um, and uh, my job uh, was to select and to reduce. So in that sense, when you are an editor, you are reducing material, actually in order to make it live. So I have been reducing, 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 reducing. It's like making a sculpture. You are carving away material. And the interesting thing here is that I had already did that. So I was down to a couple of hours. Yeah. And I think maybe Ida is using 20% of that yeah. in this, this movie. So yeah, you gave me like two hours. Tommy selected what he found was essential for this project. So I got the two hours, and I did look through the two hours, but I got access to the whole library of the 14 mm. hours of footage. And I actually went to that library, and you know, so I got to look all over it. And this is a part of the project also to invite Ida, which is a, a multi-performer, bass player, and composer also. She's not an editor, she's also an editor. She's also a documentary movie maker. Yeah. So it's not about that you uh, was editing, you were, yeah. listening and also wondering yeah. about the same material but from another it point is, of view. I think <laughs> editing, editing is much about listening. You get so much into the characters, what are they actually saying, what is the DNA in each person and you know collecting, doing representative uh, moments, putting them together but also it has to function as, as, a, as a film. Yeah. So, you, I mean, sometimes you have one person like Kirk, who's the guy from New York playing uh, Cornet. 
he's, he's in very short phrases, and he's almost like in a musical piece, you could say, this film is also a way of composing music to make a movie. So he's like, actually like a horn coming in sometimes in the movie, just have short sentences. And then you have a part of like, in the beginning of the, mo of the movie, there's this um, Swedish guy playing folk, this folk instrument, the string instrument. And he's, and I mean, this movie in general is about environmental diversity. And he says he's so open, so he prefers to be alone or play with other musicians that he feel comfortable with. Mm. So in a way, this film about communication opens with this guy who in a way prefers to stay at home in the nature, but also play with other musicians. So there's a layer of loneliness in this film. It's like a partition or a score. There's a layer of communication, of curiosity, of all these things that makes actually a score of music. Mm. So it is a musical work to do a movie. Absolutely. That's why it's not, it, it, it doesn't feel uh, strange for me as a musician to, to, to go to this media. Mm. Yeah, it seems quite natural actually. And from the movie, uh, these musicians, we have, uh, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> sorry, uh, of course I have met them many times and also during these interviews, but um, they have never played together. And they, in fact, never met each other. Some of them have met each other, and some of them have played together in other situations. But this ensemble has never met. So they will meet in the end of November here in Denmark for the first time. Uh, but the thing is, the project has moved to a... Uh, say I'm, I'm in the middle of it. It feels like I'm still in the middle of doing this research because they never met. So, so the, the next move is to... Um, to, um, to play music I have uh, facilitated. I will show a couple of methods now uh, where I have tried to make um, a three-step uh, module to compose music out from the conversations and not from my musical knowledge itself. Because I have used my life on trying to be better at music. So of course I, I know uh, some stuff. <laughs> Uh, so I really try to remove that knowledge and see if I could use some other knowledge to create music for this ensemble. So when, when, um, when they meet, I really, really don't know if that will be uh, work or not. Maybe that will be a catastrophe. I don't know. But um, uh, that's really a part of this uh, project to see how, how, what will happen mm. when we actually will, are going to play. Uh, play this uh, music. Um, so, this one we already a little bit talked about. I'll go further on. You! Oh, shit. There we go. But that's true what he's saying also. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I had so many questions in this project uh, all uh, over, over, the, over this uh, uh, two years, and I have postponed the project for them to come here in a way three times now because of the COVID. So I was not so interested anymore in, in that part of the project. I was more interested in the, in the, in the um, understanding of how we react in our environments. So the music was a little bit on, the, on pause. But um, I had many questions. Here is, I will just show the third one, which is actual right now for me. How can the composer ensure that the method used can both be based on the experiences and at the same time create space to let go of the experiences. So that's what I'm trying to do uh, at the moment. And uh, one composer I have read a lot about over the years and also included in this project is Earl Brown. If you don't know him, he's an American, <coughs> American composer who was active in the 50s and the 60s, uh, especially um, along with John Cage. But he has a technique called uh, to take a chance. Chance is a technique. I try to follow that path a little bit in this, um, in this research, uh, which makes me more free, and I try to think more freely when I'm composing into these uh, um, uh, ways of composing. So here is the three different ways I'm trying to do this. So the first one I call the imaginary model. It's, it's, I'm trying to change the idea about an actual sound and an imaginary sound. 
first of all. So the actual sound is my knowledge about how things actually is sounding from them or from myself or from knowledge of sound. And the other one is an imaginary sound which iteratively, which you structure it like that in models, maybe can shape repetitive strengths in processing of imaginary ideas. So I don't have to lock down the sound and I can still keep it like flying around. The second one, which is like the main, the main uh, model I'm trying to use, or have already used now, because I have composed this music, is in fact just uh, uh, ready composed uh, for the meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, I call it a toolbox. So it's the conversation who is leading, who is leading the, uh, the, the input to what I can receive of new information from, from another musician. Then I put it down, and when, when I write toolbox, I, I'm trying to capture what they say and how they sound, humanly and musically. Then I will get ideas to investigate. Then I can take a round more, or I can take as many rounds as I want. And sometimes I can jump down, and I can do what's called composing, <laughs> um, which is more or less freezing down some small elements of ideas. This is an extract from this toolbox. I mean, this is normal uh, musical notation, but it's not only the notes, it's also an al analysis of, of the human uh, output, but also some, some more technical musical uh, information, because I asked them to play uh, the thing they, they love to play mostly for 30 seconds. So this is an extract of 30 seconds of playing. So I'm trying to listen or react and listen and sense it and then listen again and then create in that order. Out from this toolbox and these small ideas, I try to freeze them down into small, small moods, which is more an extract of an entrance composition, an entrance of taking further on from every individual musician. So, from the knowledge from these specific persons, I'm creating small moods. So, um, to try to explain it on this, uh, it's, we have the music in the middle, and we can react on it, we can play it, we can lead it, we can follow it. We can play it deep. When I say play deep, I mean you are like, you disappear into the sound of music. Uh, you can respect the surroundings, for example. This is just, it could be also many other things. Uh, but this can happen when you have partituras or scores which is individually made for every uh, musician. So here is an example of music which is written two weeks ago. This is, on the left, you can see uh, the score for Kirk Knafke, who played the cornet in the movie. And to the right, you can see the score for Sina Asmussen, who was singing in the end of the movie. So this is um, marked by small entrance ideas out from knowledge of Sina or Kirk. So these small moods doesn't fit together. They only fit individually together. And if you morph them, maybe it will be uh, beautiful music. The most important thing here is that I cannot control this music. Mm. I have tried to facilitate the composition through the knowledge of these persons, but I am not going to try to uh, moderate or control the output of my composition. Yeah. So, the, uh, the composer, I will try to see, and we can talk about this yeah. uh, now, uh, very soon, yeah. the, um, the, how do we facilitate uh, this. Uh, I would like to, I, I'm trying to see it as an objective facilitator, like a, an organizer in some kind of a, a way, and also how we communi communicate uh, our uh, works to, uh, uh, to other people, um, and do we have to do it alone all the time? Is the composer this kind of a, 
guy or girl who should sit on this, this fine chair and then be the composer. Is it, should it be so important to be a composer? I don't know. It's just an open question. Uh, question <laughs> that I have many questions. So yeah. I hope you have good answers. <laughs> Um, then it's also very important to talk about, I think, how to define the ensemble. The ensemble is the movie, the, the musicians in the movie is the ensemble, and the ensemble, I, as a facilitator of the project, I have to try to define what that is. I don't have to know what it is, but I have to try to define what it is. That's more or less uh, uh, more interesting, I think. And also the big thing about the improvi improvisational musician and the non-improvisational musician, which is in our culture, in our, in our um, uh, or the improvising dancer or the non-improvising dancer. Can you say that or can you not say that? I mean, they are saying that. I'm not saying that. So I'm just trying to find out as a composer, what do we see and what do we hear? This is just a model of how do we listen to it? Are we aware of how we see things and how we hear things? Mm -hmm. I will just read this very short. This is an anthropologist, Henry Giddings. I like this quote very much. All arts, we must remember, are faces of the social mind. We are so much in the habit of thinking of them in terms of art products that we forget that the arts themselves are groups of ideas and acquisitions of skill that ex exist only in the minds, muscles, and nerves of living men. We can think about that for a while. I <laughs> think about that every day. But, uh, yeah, I have many uh, last uh, uh, reflections I'm doing. We are not going to talk about that now, but uh, there is many things to discover and to <coughs> try to open up. Um, I have used quite many uh, inspirations uh, during this project, both um, a theater project, House Visit Europe, and also um, a very interesting research called Cross-Culture Perspectives in Music and Musicality from Canada, um, and trying to not measure, but just trying to get inspired and see things in, and the rest is more or less uh, music and one Danish philosopher. So uh, that was about uh, the interest, uh, how can you say, the um, starting point of our discussion and trying to uh, show the, um, the extracts of my methods in composing and also the interest in taking the environmental diversity into the composition room. For me, um I read all through the material, and uh, as you know, I've also been in the uh, which means that I've been reading the applications also, your applications, and followed the project on a distance. This is the first time that I encounter it this way. Uh, I will start by discussing the composer's role, which would be interesting to hear from you. Mm -hmm. You created this toolbox as a base for the creation of music with the aim of redefining the composer's role from being a subjective sovereignty to become more of a facilitator. So that a composer can move from being their own subjective point of view to take a more objective point. Mm. Mm. Uh, you say, an objective point of departure in an overview of the participating musicians' fields of expression and comfort zones. Uh, you recognize this? Yeah, good. I think but I wrote it myself, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but I translated yeah. it to English, so sometimes I, you know, when I translate, yeah. something gets lost. So, But isn't there a moment here where you, as a facilitator, makes crucial decisions? I quote you. The facilitator's role is largely to translate the individual musician's preconceptions to modelable artistic material that makes it possible to release and communicate the ensemble's potential to all participants. Yeah. So here is a moment in the process where you interpret the individual musician's preconceptions to artistic material. 
You also write, write that the role of the composer will to be, be to ensure that the re result is an artistically valid and richly faceted common expression. And then I wonder, what are the parameters, ideas, aesthetic universes for being artistically valid? And who decides that? Mm. Is that up to the composer? Mm or to the musicians. Mm. So these two things would be interesting to hear you just briefly discuss. So the mm. first question was, there is a moment where you interpret and you make choices. Mm. And then there is another moment where I guess you are the one who decides what is artistically valid. Mm. I mean, you haven't met the musicians yet, so you don't know what kind of fight you are going into, but mm. <laughs> we'll see that. But just your thoughts now, how, how do you prepare for these uh, possible events? Yeah, I mean, returning back to, first of all, to, to, uh, to Earl Brown, chance is a technique, uh, is how I feel about uh, meeting these uh, musicians now. Because I have this, as you, as you say, quoting from myself, uh, these have changed during the, um, the process, I think, of this research regarding that I feel that I really don't have control of anything because I'm trying to get away from control of doing anything. So that's a little bit of a problem for me and also a strength. It, not as a defense, but more like um, a way of trying to see if can I, as a composer, have the right to say if something is valid or invalid? Can I, as a composer, define and, and, and <laughs> be unsure that I am right about you, for example? Let's say uh, I should write a piece for you, a dance piece for you, compose a dance piece. Mm. Could I decide if I know who you are? I mean, that's not possible, really. But I had to make this like frame of trying to say that I I am allowed to do that. You know, I am allowed as a human being to be aware and just to be in the spot of creation and try to do something in my way. Now, when we meet in a couple of weeks, maybe that will be totally disaster of what I wrote for them. Maybe they will really dislike the music I wrote for them. That's exciting. Yeah, that's yeah. very exciting. Yes. But I'm, I'm thinking of what is then, when does the facilitator becomes the composer? Will you still be in the program as the composer? Or will you say, compose together with? That's a very, very good question. I think... Uh, yes. Uh, sorry? You will see, probably. You will see. It's hard to say I, now. I, I yeah, I think, I, I, mean, uh, I mean, I'm an improviser. I'm absolutely an improvising. For example, um, in this situation, in this room right now, I have made like a script, and I don't follow the script at all. It's typical of me. So it's 20 pages of text laying up here, like a, like a memo thing. But um, the memo doesn't interest me, it, but, but my presence interests me. So maybe tomorrow I will put it in another way. I think, uh, and the same with composition. So for example, if I meet, or I meet other composers who works like that. One very good example is uh, a Danish composer called Pierre Dursch, mm. uh, I have been working with for almost 25 years in his band. It's called the New Jungle Orchestra. It's a Danish, Danish band, 40 years old band. And he's been working with this for 40 years. Not maybe exactly as what I'm trying to do here, but he's always been trying to uh, let go of his experiences, but also demanding that, that now you have to do this for me. You know, like, like I'm also trying to do. Like, I don't take responsibility for your actions from my own music as, as a part of calling myself a composer, for example. Did you read uh, Stefan Östersjö's Shut Up and Play? 
No, but I would love to. Yeah, he's, uh, he's discussing this when it comes to interpretation of freedom. He's referring also to Stravinsky, who didn't want anyone to interpret. The, he wanted the musicians to play. Mm. You know? And all, he has a really interesting discussion about that. So mm. I recommend it mm. as a... Thank you. Yeah. If, you. If you need just some food for thoughts mm. in your process. I'm also thinking of Anna Lindahl, a Swedish violinist. Oh, she yeah. has had a project, research project, uh, around unlearning, mm. playing Chacon uh, since she was like seven, not seven, but, and she's now 65, mm. and how that has repeatedly mm. uh, changed her life in a way. Uh, can I take another question? Uh, and the audience can also soon come in, but I have a few questions that I find important in this. You also talk about um, that you as part of the project, you will compose a genre neutral work. What is neutral? Can oh, something I, be I, neutral? No, I love that you asked that question. <laughs> but, because I love that question myself. Yeah. And I cannot answer it. But it's, um, yeah, what is, what, is, what is genre neutral? I don't know. I use it, maybe, I start to use it more and more just to taste it and to see uh, how it feels to say it to myself sure. uh, and to my friends and colleagues and see if they get like super annoyed or <laughs> they really like it or they feel like they also are natural in a way. In my, I, to try to say anything about it, I would say if, if we can have a conversation about creating things and be aware of listening, maybe we don't have to talk about genres. Mm. Maybe we don't have to talk about if you are from India or Denmark. Mm. Maybe we don't have to talk about these things we are always starting to talk about. So th th there is something, just to say something shortly now, yeah. maybe there is somebody else who has a, mm. a brilliant answer or can uh, talk about this or you, yourself, but uh, that's the main outgoing thing of thinking mm. genre neutral. Not especially in music or mm. musical genres. You can do that too, of course, but... Mm. Um, I'm thinking also of uh, when asking questions. It doesn't necessarily mean that you would like to have an answer. It's also asking a question to see what happens when I'm asking myself this question. And so when I'm asking questions now, it's not that I'm expecting an answer. It's, it's more like, what happens when we talk yeah. about this? What is... Yeah. Because uh, the question of being neutral is, is a very uh, complex question, I think, but in the arts, to say that something doesn't communicate or doesn't mm. uh, point in any direction. So, uh, so it's interesting that you dare to use it, I must say. Yeah. Uh, during the process, you have constantly documenting reflections around the process to subject them to a thorough analysis, to find answers on your questions, you say. How, how is this an analysis done? How are they done? How do you do it when um, you analyze? Uh, I cannot analyze them. Uh, I am trying to use my, my skills as a human being to analyze them. I think. Uh, I cannot say that I, 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 I have some, some system and then I can analyze and through it to a machine and then it comes out the ticket. <laughs> so, yeah, you're blue. <laughs> but, yeah. That would be very boring. Uh, but the thing is that I have, um, I'm just very interested mm. also but I'm in, thinking, in, in, do you have in a, analyzing. Do you have a group that you can discuss with someone coming from the outside, like an outside eye that you can discuss with so that you get a kind of, uh, at least I, I find uh, in the research projects that I've done, it's so easy to be, you know, you become the truth yourself in a way and, and how can you, it, something happens also in this kind of situation when you present, you, mm. you get a kind of resistance or friction which is important. And I'm just thinking as a, as a help, uh, mm -hmm. To have that kind of discussion, yeah. maybe you are the. I mean, we have you're discussed many the things. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Ida, Ida is. I invited Ida to to uh, see if she was interesting to be part of this uh, project, mm -hmm. and um, luckily you were 
because mm. I've seen your works earlier, both movies and music and, in, and play, your playing as a mm. musician. And in fact, we are both bass players, which is quite <laughs> yeah. interesting also. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but I've not, so I've you not, have I reflected, have, a, we have talked a lot. We have talked a lot. Yeah. But it's, I have not been um, in the process that you have had with composing music out of conversations. I've not been in that, participating in that, mm. in that work, mm. creating the music. Mm. But we have been talking ab abroad. <laughs> yeah. But I see what you mean, and but it's also the. Uh, it's first now at the, this this dialogue uh, will appear, and I'm I'm like sucking for the dialogue, yeah. and I, I'm looking so much forward to have the dialogue right now here with you, yeah. and also um, f in the future with this project, so I can like release the project as just a forum, mm. you know, yeah. so I, I can. Uh, I told Tommy before that. Uh, um, I'm supervising a PhD candidate who is working on expanding the uh, space for the actor within an artistic process. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it reminds a little bit, um, but uh, that could also be something that could be inspiring for maybe a talk between the two of you mm. uh, would be something uh, also that could nurture your, your mm. process. Um, and we have seen this in dance a lot that uh, you get a score as a performer which just says like, stand like a midsummer pole, mm. look at your grand grandmother's meatballs, mm. and, and you know, mm. and, and everyone interpret them in a way that they find, mm. so you know, those kinds, of, this is not what you are doing here. You have a mood, you give them moods. You said, could you give a concrete example of a mood? Yes. It can be something out from a, a person's uh, behavior, skills. As I know their behavior skills, I don't know all of their life and how they act, but the way I know them, it can be, for example, if I feel, uh, let's say, for example, that, um, uh, let's take an example from the movie, maybe. Mm, let's take uh, the piano player, Oscar Martin from Sevilla. Yeah? Yeah. The, yeah. the, the <laughs> classically beautiful. educated concert piano player. Yeah. Um, his score, I don't have this score, I'm for, I cannot show it unfortunately right now, but um, that's, um, uh, these moods are much longer than the others. I mean, I think he has like 14 pages of score, and oh. some of the musicians only have like half a page of score. Mm -hmm. So it's very uh, like mm -hmm. diverse. But, but to come back to the question, sorry, <laughs> goes fast to jump off the topic. <laughs> uh, a mood could be, for example, black and white keys. Because he, he moves very gentle, he's very poetic. He learned to play poetic out from a certain style or a certain mood of a certain composer. So if, I, so if he plays, for example, on the black keys, he will play in one way, in that tempo. But if he play on the white keys, he will play differently in another tempo. So if it's Bach, it's probably white keys. If it's Debussy, it's black keys, right? So if I mix these two, and I arrow them to play upwards or downwards, so I say B, arrow up. And I say white, arrow down, freeze, for example. Okay, how will that sound? Okay, he will, he, he already called me. <laughs> he received his score, he okay. called me and he said, I don't understand this black and white, what is that? And I said, I'm not gonna answer that question, but take a look at it again and see if you can find some kind of a, you know, idea about what that could be, you know? So it's also, it's already problematic. But uh, that's, that's a typical mood mm. in a score, because I'm not gonna tell them what to do. Oh, okay, yeah. I got it. I have a quite long question, so maybe I should ask the audience first if someone has a question, and then we see if I have time for my long question. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, thank you for this wonderful presentation and, and, uh, and the video. Um, I'm curious about um, these conversations that you showed. You had these points of uh, neutral space, uh, phenomenological approach, and uh, so on, uh, that it interests me very much how you, how you find as a composer, 
also or as a coordinator, or as an organizer, or as an artist to collect people from different disciplines or the same disciplines. I mean, there's a space here where you that you have to create a, a special modus. It's a space that also extends over time, I know. And, but you have to create this space of openness but that is at the same time solid. And I think there's a lot of references here also to my Sol's idea of the not only space that ex at the same time extend the situation, but, at the, at, but it's also anchored. So it's, it's an openness, but it's also very centered uh, and uh, central at the same time. And you say, uh, actually I was curious about, uh, because you say you have a phenomenological approach, but I'm curious what that means to you. Is it the phenomenological approach in the people who are there, the surrounding political situation that we are separated so far away from each other, maybe isolated even, and that the conversation somehow or working together becomes more, has a bigger part in the artistic process. It's more, uh, uh, somehow it's more important now in these times. Or I don't know what you mean about, uh, or if you can expand a bit on, on the phenomenological approach. Mm. I hear a bit like ha Haraway's uh, situated knowledge. It's, it's sometime, something to do with mm. the situate, situation and the material, material mm. that is there, mm. that, that is human, and in this situation also mm. music mm. or instruments. And, mm. Yeah, but what you mean about the phenomenological approach. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. the great question and, and thought about that. Um, um, in fact, using that word, um, phenomenological approach, is very private uh, and it's dangerous to use also because it includes like, so, such a big, uh, huge area of knowledge about that, just isolated about that. Um, and I thought maybe uh, many times if I, sh I should not use that word at all and just call it non-question behavior or um, trying not to be um, hitting with a knife down in, so how is the political system right now? Or do you like the new president? Or, you know, I don't, I don't want to go there at all in this project. And as a human being in my life, uh, I could go there with somebody else if it's interesting in it. But in this project, I wanted really to avoid that. So I wanted to avoid the question which will lead directly to something, to a statement. I wanted to see if the conversation could lead to, uh, to understanding and awareness about that we are talking about something more than, than knowing about something. I don't know if that was the answer on your question, but... Yeah, I have a question, um, which is might be um, of a maybe maybe you mentioned or maybe it's just a clarifying. But these scores or these moods that you made for the the musicians, are they um, kind of the are they what they will be performing together, or is it like a tool, kind of a sketching to to is it part of a conversation towards the final score in a way? This is the final score okay. you just saw. Yeah. Yeah. This is the score who is sent to the musicians individually. It's 11 different musicians and 12 include, I'm also playing, so I also have to make a score for myself. And this is a <laughs> critical one. Um, but I did already, yeah. And, and they will be performing them together? And then we will perform together, yes. Okay. First of all, we will have a workshop two and a half days of only playing together six hours a day for three days with no agenda and see what happens. And that's in the end of November. Maybe you should tell the dates. What? Yeah, there will be a performing in Copenhagen also, the 26th of yeah. November. Yeah. yeah, and then in Odense and Espia. Yeah, and I will participate in one part of it also. So what's actually going to happen is that we are going to make a new short movie trying to make a kind of a, anyway, a stamp down in what's going to happen when we play this music out from the conversations into the toolboxes, mm -hmm. into the moods, into the actual playing, into yeah. a new movie. And see if, uh, 
they maybe just really dislike this project, or if they think that this maybe could be used for somebody else. And I'm also interested to see if it can be used in teaching. Yeah, that's what catch my interest too, that it's in one way very professional in, in the music field, but why not use this in another field? Like, imagine if we could communicate in this way in the government or somewhere else, anywhere else actually, mm -hmm. that would be this musical way of, or artistic way of, of communicating. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is interesting. But really try to answer your question even more precisely maybe. Yeah. Uh, is this the scores you're going to use? Uh, the thing is that I don't even know if they're going to use it. But uh, that, anyway, that's the scores. <laughs> it's not going to be used any other scores. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how to uh, to ask the question, but I'm thinking about um, so there's like a long tradition in like the visual arts um, as well, like very specifically of deconstructing the partition and the score and um, looking at it from maybe a non-musician place and I think my question is how do you see that from this because I feel like there's a certain level of skill or like you said it's important for you that the musicians are professional um, so how do you when something is in, um, environmental I guess it has to, like the musician says there's smell there's like all these things that you're surrounded with that affects you yeah. um, what do you think about that um, in terms of this score mm. and the level of skill mm. and that gap between the musician and that non-musician, maybe. Mm. If it makes sense. I, absolutely. I think I understand your, your thought. Question. Uh, regarding the profession, uh, call it like pro a professional musician, I choose to, to have members inside of this uh, research project who is used to travel a lot. So that when the situation comes that we are going to meet that that part of, of playing music professionally should feel quite normal to come to another place and meet these other musicians so that if we say that we have non-professional uh, non musicians who is not working with this and been, how do you say, put up, up to pressure, playing concerts, installations, and so on, uh, different places, different environments, will probably be able to take their professional part of their output with them when meeting all these other people mm. in, in, the, in the room. And about the non-musician, non um, or let's say, I think we are all musicians. Mm. So, but let's say non-professional musicians. I don't even see myself as a professional musician. I'm using it as to say, okay, a profession, somebody who earns money on traveling around and playing music. <laughs> as a professional musician. Then you can, whatever. I don't know how to describe that better, but. Um, I was afraid of losing control of the project if I had people who liked to play on instruments and do the same project. Mm. I'm, I'm not willing to take that risk mm. yet. But that will also be a beautiful, interesting pro, uh, like, uh, processing and also another kind of a research. I think that will be another kind of a research project. But uh, very interesting question. Would it be more environmental? It will be more env environmental, uh, but I wanted to uh, scratch the surface to see how the composed role can change. And that's why I also had to limit myself a little bit. I remember the first application I made, it was a disaster because I couldn't behave myself about so many thoughts and ideas I wanted to include in this project. So it's, um, I'm happy you say that because that's really, uh, that's, I, for me in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to increase and uh, mm. limit myself. <laughs> I have that problem. I have, I have, okay, cool, okay. We have a oh, it was loud. Uh, we have a question from the one of the followers online, um, Kiris Pudarus, who asks: On what criteria did you select the musicians? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Oh, it's what difficult to hear. On on what criteria did you select the musicians? On which criteria? Yeah, first is they they are uh, working within music and have been working within music for quite many years are used to travel, like, my, like in the movie I also say, this research is made on my own 
uh, experience as a traveler. So it's the same, they are, they are picked in as the same, we are like on the same wave there. And also uh, the, the third criteria is that um, they said yes immediately to be a part of it. So if there was somebody who could have said, no, can you, can you tell me more about it? Then I maybe will not include that person. So that was also, that was maybe just pure luck, I don't know. But that was the criteria that I had. Yeah. Yeah. And the same person asks also another question here regarding the genre neutral. And the question is, is genre neutral, um, if genre neutral refers to the idea of music, no, sorry. Does genre neutral refer to the idea of music for music's sake? It it's doesn't have. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't have to be music at all. Okay. It's, when I say genre neutral, I'm not especially connecting it to music. It's also who are you as a, what genre are you, or who, which genre am I, or what kind of a, where do I put myself, and how do I speak about myself to other people? How do we talk about things when we meet? How do we talk about things when we meet? Or in music, if we should do it, I don't know how to call it, is it natural uh, genre? I think every human being is natural. It's, it's a, a personal way of doing things. And I think when we put things together in music, we are limiting the possibility of exploring things together. That's maybe why I'm trying to use this word and I, I cannot def uh, like, um, say anything about uh, uh, why I do that. I'm, I'm taking the risk and I'm taking the chance to use it so far in a way. <laughs> Thank you. There is a little uh, slipping stone here that I, I have to touch upon it, even if it's, um, it's very sensitive. And it has to do with this, um, uh, you choose... Uh, musicians from different countries to map artistic, cultural, musical similarities and differences and to let them form the basis for composing based on their personal expression. It's many different things here. Your co-researchers, or do you prefer that I call them musicians? The musicians or co-researchers, mm. they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, They are from different cultures, religions, economies and musical environments. Mm. I guess that you don't think that coming from Denmark means that you have all the same preferences and personal expressions. But anyway, you reached out internationally to find musicians. How did you avoid a kind of essentialist or nationalist idea that a certain nationality would mean something specific? Or in your choice, were you just trying to find as different environmental diversity mm. as possible? Do you follow me in my question? Because it, it is... Uh, um, I've been reading very thoroughly and, and uh, what you write, and sometimes I get a little bit confused mm. uh, to this, because I, I can also feel, of course we are different depending on where mm. we are from, um, mm. what kind of influences we have, mm. but a person from Denmark could as well be quite similar to someone from Japan or mm. South Africa. Mm. Or, so it's just, just to bring that thought and I, I'm looking forward to discuss it with you after, mm. when you're done, me, me sort too. of half year yeah. after the me project too. is done. <laughs> no. uh, but I would like to finish with a question that I find really important, uh, is uh, how we, with research, uh, what it does with our practice, what it does, how, how you feel that you could also, as a pedagogue, mm. uh, for the students, uh, how you can develop your teaching and mm. how you also can develop your artistic practice, so mm. to say, mm. your outreach mm. outside of the academia. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about that, mm. if you had any experiences of, uh, that you could just elaborate around when mm. it comes to what research has done or what it, what it does? Yeah. Because for me, it's very difficult to say, this is artistic research. I think mm. it's much more interesting to discuss what can it do mm. What can it do? <laughs> yeah. I was, in a, I was um, uh, participating in a symposium last year where there was a French artistic researcher, I forgot the name now, um, 
where he in fact mentioned this problem, he had this problem, that is there a difference between artistic research and artistic uh, um, we'll say practice? Yeah. And um, he meant it was a big, huge difference between artistic practice and artistic research. And I've been trying also to, to find with myself in a way and with my colleagues, um, uh, I don't see myself at all as a researcher. I am uh, seeing myself trying to open up other possible ways, cracks. You can call it as research, but as soon as I put myself into that box, I think that I have to be an academic person. You see? Uh, and that's problematic for me, so I, I am not an academic person, and I will probably never be an academic person, which is absolutely okay, mm. just to be. So the thing is that by, by having that in mind, when teaching, for example, or being a guide to somebody else who is doing the same thing, mm, I see the artistic practice as a much more valuable action than to sit on my chair and do research. Because the research has to come from some kind of a practice for me. I'm not saying that it should do that for you or for somebody else, but for me, it has to be out from a practice. Yeah, uh, but I think my question was more that your insights that you gain through uh, mm -hmm. and how you can transform them also ah, into okay, your sorry. teaching. No, uh, yeah. I was unclear in no, my no. question. So. I think it's quite easy to transform it. Mm. Uh, and it's also and beautifully to feel that, in fact, my students anyway, when I, when I, when I <clears throat> have composition classes, for example, or talking about artistic reflection, uh, it's so interesting that, see, if I use my own research as a motive or a, mm. a snap, mm. uh, they will ask much more questions. <laughs> and it's like, why are you doing that, you know? Why, and I why, think why did, we are did, done now. Uh, done I, now. I feel yeah. someone is... Yeah. <laughs> time, it's time 12 o'clock. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank yeah, you, Ida. Thank you. And uh, thank you, audience. And thank you for your questions. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.